Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon, everybody. It's lit sock, so it's Thursday afternoon. Welcome. Um, after the triumph of Friday, the best lit sock Shakespeare slam ever. Huzzah! Huzzah. <laughs> um, we are back under the trees, um, in, enjoying the springtime. It's a bit warmer now than it was a bit earlier, uh, even though I have got my blanket. Um, and uh, it is uh, courtesy of Mr. Close, who discovered this. It's storytelling um, in um, America this week, uh, National Storytelling Weekday, Tuesday. And he just told us a story on Tuesday for assembly uh, with a really good message, I thought. And we are going to share our own stories this afternoon, stories we have found and that we like, or just randomly. I found mine this morning at uh, ten past six. Uh, mine is actually a poem. Um, it's translated from the Dutch. I found this in a wonderful bookstore in Holland, in Amsterdam, um, the year before last. Uh, you get a you get the Dutch. I won't attempt to read the Dutch. Um, Mrs. Overwater could read it for me, but unfortunately, still she's still working. And uh, then you get a translation as well and it is a story even though it's a very short story and it's by Gerrit Achterberg who lived from 1905 to 1962 anybody heard of them no okay well there's a challenge we have to go out and find um, and it's called Gamekeeper which I will try and say in Dutch Jak Top Zina Jak Top Zina I chanced to meet my gamekeeper of late and asked about the shape the deer were in. He hummed and hawed and drew a bashful spate of runic signs in gravel with his shoe. I like the man since his appointment date. The goodwill seemed to be quite mutual too. Why was I thrown completely in a spin, as if he'd long failed to communicate? There's often more, while, more, sorry, there's often one more than the count should be, he said, concerned, and looked me in the eye. In his, insanity and truth ran free, and jockeyed for position constantly. The trees inclined towards us from the sky. Then from afar, the house bell rang for tea. <laughs> <laughs> I like the ending. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. It's a mystery as Mr. Henslow might say. Um, I really like that because I liked the um, the fact that the narrator doesn't quite, doesn't quite know whether it's truth or insanity. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of uh, transformation things and when people become other than they are. Is it the gamekeeper or is it her, him, yes. joining the herd of deer? Yes, yes, moments of transition. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Excellent. So I like that. And you, and yes. you, and very you, short. It is. And you came across it at six this morning. I did. Just uh, <laughs> quite early. Well, yes, yeah, it's yeah. I was up Dutch early. Bones, I was up it? early because I um, I needed to get the cups out of the dishwasher for this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Our cups and. Yes, yes. Um, I made myself a cup of tea and then I thought, oh, what am I going to read? Shall it be a Christmas story? No, I thought we did those at Christmas. So I then looked in here um, and they had ballads and things, but I thought, no, I'll see if I can find something else. And that, yeah, mm -hmm. really, okay. I really, that really grabbed me. Sort of Ted Hughesy like with the deer and the nature. Yeah, like that. So, okay, right, somebody else now. Eloise. Eloise, you, uh, I will. And, <laughs> and move it. Oh, give, give Miss Rio both jobs. Yeah, Eloise, the mic, Eloise, the mic you move and her? the camera move. So yeah, remember, girls, uh, you need to hold the mic up to yourself so we can hear you. Okay. Do you want somebody else to help hold the mic? Oh no, it's fine. I can hold it. It's okay. cool. Yeah. <laughs> um. Um. This is why the sea is salty. It's based on a Korean folk tale. But this is retold by Rosie Dickens. Okay. Um, long, long ago, the world was very different. Even the sea wasn't salty, but sweet and good to drink. So why, you might wonder, is the sea not sweet today? Well, to begin with, a millstone. The millstone belonged to the mighty king. Most millstones are used to make flour, but this millstone made piles of gold and sparkling jewels. It made tempting treats and special spices, 
whatever the king asked for. One day, a thief met a friend who told him all about the magic millstone. I want it, thought the thief. I'll be richer than I've ever dreamed. He scratched his head. I just have to find out where the king keeps it. So he went to the palace. A friendly guard gave the thief a grand tour. He saw the gardens and the throne room, and he, but he couldn't find the magic millstone anywhere. In the royal bedroom, he had an idea. This palace is magnificent, he said to the guard. But I'm sorry not to see the magic millstone. I expect the king keeps it hidden. The guard laughed. Of course he does, he replied. It is his greatest treasure after all. As they walked, the king kept chatting. I bet you don't even know where the millstone is kept, he teased the guard. Oh, yes I do, said the guard, under the king's bed. What a clever hiding place, said the thief. And I suppose you have to be a great magician to work the millstone. Oh no, said the guard. The king simply taps at it three times and asks for whatever he wants. Later that night, the thief crept back to the palace. He tiptoed into the king's bedroom, lifted the mattress and grabbed the millstone. Hiding the millstone under his cloak, he raced away as fast as he could. He ran all the way to the sea where he leapt into a waiting boat and sailed away. Out at sea, the thief gazed at the millstone. I can have anything I want, he thought. What shall I ask for first? He took out a bun to nibble while he decided. The bun didn't taste too good. Pa, he sprayed. That needs salt. So he tapped the millstone three times and asked in a clear voice, Please, may I have some salt? At once the millstone began turning and bright white salt pulled out. The thief felt, fell asleep with a smile on his face, dreaming of the riches. All night long the magic millstone kept turning. The pile of salt grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Still the millstone kept turning. The thief woke up to a mountain of salt towering over him. Stop now, shouted the thief. The millstone didn't stop. That's enough, he yelled. But the millstone kept on turning and the mountain of salt piled higher. The salt was so heavy that the boat began to sink in the water. Before, long waves were sloping over the sides and still the millstone kept turning. Frantically, the thief borrowed into the salt. I have to help that millstone, he gasped. But it was buried far too deep. The millstone kept on turning until finally the boat sank. The magic millstone went with it, sinking down to the bottom of the ocean. The thief swam home, where an angry king stood on the shore waiting for him. As for the millstone, it is still at the bottom of the sea, pouring out salt to this very day. Um, no, it's from a book that I had when I was little that was like folk tales from around the world, and I really liked that one, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mickey Mouse made buckets. Yes. Great. Thank you. Do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Right, so um, I couldn't think of a suitable story off the top of my head, so I thought I'd just. Did you write one then? Yeah, well, (laughs) technically. I, I, this is the one I wrote for my mock exam in January, so... Okay. Oh, yeah, so All right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 29 out of 30. 29 out of 30, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, we'll see well. what... Well, Could have been better. <laughs> Could have been better, but... Uh... Where's that missing mark? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Plumley ate it. Miss Plumley. Okay. Okay. My handwriting is a bit hard to read, so... Okay. He heard the door slam. There wasn't much to it. The road was long but the man that embarked on it was longer. Before all this, and it was an even longer before, his chin pointed high above crowds. At a mention of the weather, he would breathe in, sniff the air, and tell all whether to expect sun or rain from his great heights. He was always wrong. He was wrong about many things. The way car engines worked, the way kittens sneezed, the way doors slammed. But he, unlike myself, was compassionate in a way that I will never properly understand. He might have felt compassion for the door, even. I am the type of person to drive around the block to look at car accidents. I say the road was long, but perhaps that isn't the right word. Slow, naked, something to indulge in for a few blissful seconds before reality, soon and sure enough, sinks deep into the gut and stays there. The road was and is not to be left behind. It is not to be disobeyed. 
Across the open fields are regrettably so more open fields and walking along the ugly smooth rough road only results in more ugly smooth rough road. He would have realised that. He must have realised that when he strolled a few metres, whistled a tune and heard that tune stop dead in the air. Notes trapped in mist, although there was none. There was just road. I say all of this about who about the road, but I do not speak about before. Before was a time before now when who walked the earth and not the road. Before was a time before now when we had families and lovers and children. Before was a time before now when I speak to you. We were, as I recall, shepherded into a room with a door. Tight, sharp, white, clean. In clear, simple terms, we were told that one would enter and the rest come out. There were fights, of course, about whose children were younger, cuter, who had a family, a home, a job to go back to. Of course, we didn't know what was behind the door. And, of course, I had a family. Hugh's shoulders were pulled, skin yanked, eyes scratched as they pulled him towards the door. They opened it. They slammed it. He must have heard the door slam. And now he walks. I was there and I did nothing. And now I am here and I do nothing except talk to you. I don't know what happened to Hugh. He was left behind by them and by me. The road twists and tugs and turns. It sticks needles through your feet and expects you to stay upright. The dry ache of the atmosphere cements your skin until it bleeds. The days are long and there is no night. There is no rest for the wanderers of the road who wander and wander and wander. There is no particular weather to tell of on the road. There is no way to be tall. Engines don't work and kittens don't sneeze. My name used to be Hugh. I can't think what it is now. What was the assignment, so to speak? Um, we got a choice of questions, but I chose a prompt that was he heard the door slam. He heard the door slam. Mm. And she ran with it. Yeah, she did. Fantastic. Yes, the road goes ever, ever on. The road goes ever on and on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, very vivid. I, mm. I just, the way you described him as well. It was great. Mm. Thanks. Well done. Yeah. The, um, the waiting for his name. Mm. Mm. Well, um, I wrote my story, um, well I wrote it for a competition a few months ago and we were given, we were only given the title and it had to be like 500 words long and the title was When I Needed a Friend. I never needed a true friend before. Friends lied, they cheated and they could hurt you the most. I didn't want to be hurt. Two years ago my best friend died of cancer and I was left devastated. She was my only friend. She understood me, she made me laugh and she was there when I needed her the most. I thought that my life could never be the same again. There was a huge hole inside of me longing to be filled, but I couldn't bear to fill it. The thought of the past haunted me like a shadow that wouldn't leave, but I had to remember the past to look for the future. I had to be whole again. It started last year when I felt I was losing someone again. All the memories rushed back like a tsunami burying me under the waves. My mum had got cancer. It wasn't possible, but it was. Why did all these bad things have to happen to me? It wasn't fair. What had I done to deserve this? I didn't need anyone to come into my life right now, but in reality, it was a friend that I needed the most. I spent days shut inside my bedroom, having no hope of what was to come. However, my dad realised I had to get some fresh air. I didn't want to, although it was a sunny day, so I reluctantly walked outside. About an hour into my walk, this girl bumped into me and smiled. It was a smile that I had not seen in a long time and really needed. We talked for a while, getting to know each other. Actually, she did most of the talking, but I had to go home eventually. Every day I would leave home to go meet with her. Her name was Sunny and she really did make my day bright. I was finally making a new friend. Sunny was a parrot. Not in a copying kind of way, but as in she talked like mad. She made me laugh and forget about what was going on at home. I told her a bit about my mum and what happened, but she, but she said that you only live life once, so keep going when things get tough. That was my favourite quote. My mum was still in the hospital, but my happiness was being lifted by Sunny. I was still sad about my mum, but kept going. Now five weeks had passed since I had met my new friend, and a miracle happened. It was the exact day that I took Sunny to see my mum. We rushed to see her, but when we arrived, she wasn't there. I started panicking and nearly cried my eyes out, but I felt a warm touch on my shoulder. It couldn't be true. I burst out crying to see my mum standing as a cancer survivor. 
I learnt one thing that day. If you want the rainbow, you've got to put up with the rain. Did you win? Uh, we don't know yet. Oh. Still waiting to be replied to. Um, it was a, a, it was like, um, a bookstore competition, and the person who was judging it was Cressa the Cowl. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. So, when, when is the day? Do you know what day it is? No, we're just, like, waiting to receive an email or something. Okay, so my story is about when I got my cat, Clover. She was very small back then, but I can't say the same about her now. Anyway, it was year four in my old primary school, and it was pancake day. Not exactly suitable for how she looks now, but I'll stop talking about that. So I was just taking my shoes off coming into the house when my mum told me to turn around on the stairs. I remember, that, I remember thinking that I had no idea what was going on. So I turned around and I saw my cat. My first thought was that a stray cat had walked in through the upstairs window, which was quite stupid because that was a skylight on the third floor. But Clover obviously wasn't a stray. She was my new cat. She's black and white and has a bad habit of scratching my hands, which you may have noticed. The The strange thing is, is that none of my family have scratches and I really can't think why. Nothing to do with the fact that I, that I annoy her at all, I'm completely sure. So I had turned around back to my mum with my mouth wide open. What was going on? She must have inferred from my stuttering that I thought she was a stray cat. Admittedly, my stuttering was something along the lines of, what? Window? Cat? Because she nodded while saying, we got her today. When I finally processed this, My mouth opened even wider, which was hard to do as it was already very, very open. And that's the story of how I got my cat, Clover. To this day, I'm still excited when I see her four years later. Who's next? Uh, Miss Rio, sure. Um, I don't know where, where can I sit? <laughs> uh, Do you want to swap with me? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, so if you point it towards Miss Huntley, then. Uh, yeah, well, I'll go and. Well, now I have to follow two nice stories that people have written. <laughs> Three nice stories. Sorry, I'm kind of um, <laughs> I've not written mine, but I chose. Julian is a mermaid, which was the uh, Greenaway shortlist. Oh, yeah. Did it win? I think it did. I think it did. I think it did. I don't know. I don't. I'm not as clued up on Greenaway as I'm. No, Carnegie. we don't do it. But anyway, I remember reading this when we shadowed it, and I loved it. It's so lovely. I don't know if you have you girls you read it. it. Okay. Really well, didn't we? reading clog through that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's more um, pictures than it is words but I think you can tell a story through pictures yeah just as much well I'll tell the story like you do with kids (laughs) oh yeah let's see if we can do that let me know if you can't see this is a boy named Julian and this is his nana and those are some mermaids (laughs) Julian loves mermaids (laughs) (laughs) Can you see? <laughs> so he's obviously imagining that he's swimming. And there's that one, which is lovely. I mean, if it didn't win. <laughs> yeah, it should have won. It should have done. And there he is. Seeing a big fish. Obviously, he's still on the bus. <laughs> Let's go, honey. This is our stop. <laughs> Nana, did you see the mermaids? I saw them, honey. <laughs> I think he's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Nana, I'm also a mermaid. I'm going to take a bath. You be good. 
Julian has an idea. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you girls can see properly. Oh, that's so hard to yeah. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Anna's not impressed. Anna's not impressed. She's taking her curtains. Come here, honey. <laughs> mm -mm. For me, Nana. For you, Julian. She's giving oh. him some pearls or a necklace at least. Excellent. And there he is, dressed up in his full um, <laughs> mermaid garb. Where are we going? You'll see, says Nana. Hmm. Mermaids, whispers Julian. Oh, so there must have been <laughs> a festival or something. Like you, honey, let's join them. I love this um, image, I think it's so sweet. And they do. <laughs> there you go. And there's the mermaids. There's the mermaids. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Julian is a mermaid. Yeah. Yes. That was cost to shortlist it, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Did the women's price shortlist? Yesterday? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Did you watch? I didn't watch it, but I saw it on Christmas. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So we only talked about it next week. Um, mm hmm. Which I noticed was on it, but. Um, um, we've got two of them at the moment. Oh, Suzanne. Well, you've got Piranesi, which, Piranesi. We, which we've talked about <laughs> more than once. Yeah, we talked about it. Oh yeah, yeah. When I, when I was on the phone yeah. to someone, <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> no, it sounds great that one. Mm. And yeah, the, and then we got Yaga Yasu. Oh, no, oh yeah, transcendent, yeah, transcendent kingdom. Transcendent kingdom. Transcendent kingdom. No, she was on the long list. Dawn French. She was on the long list. Yes. Um, she was on um, Breakfast TV, I think, this morning about um, her new book. Oh, okay. She's written quite a few her. books, hasn't she? Yeah, yeah. she has. Yeah. She's living in Cornwall, so it's obviously done wonders for a creative. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to have to go, I'm afraid, everybody. Okay. Pick up my car. Uh, all right, I'll wrap. I'll, I'll uh, take us home then with uh, <laughs> with an African legend. Indeed, yes. Um, so this one. Oh, thank you, Miss Rue. I'll pick up the cups tomorrow. Okay, we'll just leave them in the library. Thank you, Miss Huntley. We shall see you tomorrow. Bye, Miss Huntley. Yes, and uh, hopefully this last one will <laughs> will live up to it because it is an African legend. Now, obviously, African myths, Africa is considered to be, you know, the origin of humankind. Thank you, Miss Huntley. The cradle of, well, not necessarily the cradle of civilization, actually. The cradle of the world. The cradle of the world, thank Cradle of humanity. Not the cradle of civilization. That's, that's more like, you know, Iraq and that sort of Mesopotamia, Miss Huntley, actually. But anyway... It's okay, she's gone. Back. Oh no, she is going to watch it back and she's going to have words with me tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is a story called, it's, it's the legend of Princess Yenenga. Okay, uh, I, won't, I won't give any preamble, I'll, I'll just start reading it and then I'll talk a bit more about it afterwards. Princess Yenenga was the most beautiful and beloved woman in all of the prosperous West African kingdom of Dagomba. I might be saying some of these wrong, by the way. As precious as she was to her people, None could match the love her father had for her. He praised her, not only for her unmatched beauty, but her prowess in battle and gift for taming the wildest, most powerful stallions. Her strength and courage even put his greatest warriors to shame. Despite being praised as one of the greatest warriors in all of Dagumba, Princess Yenenga was often conflicted. Sadness became a common theme throughout her days. The princess wanted her prince. Yenenga asked her father to give her away in marriage, but her father refused. How can I lose Dagumba's greatest warrior to marriage? he asked. Her father's proclamation saddened her, and her pleas fell on deaf ears. One day she had an idea. She planted a beautiful field of wheat, which impressed her father. He was so pleased that he boasted of his daughter's agricultural prowess to his elite friends, including the kings of neighbouring kingdoms. After seeing him do this, Princess Yenenga 
then allowed the wheat to rot. Troubled by this act, her father said to Yenenga, My love, what is the meaning of this? Yenenga gathered her courage and told her father, As precious as you say I am, still you let me rot like the wheat in this field. Her father was enraged and locked her away in the palace. Many months passed. Saddened by her condition, one of the king's horsemen, who looked up to her and admired her prowess on the battlefield, resolved to help her escape. He dressed her as a man and gave her a stallion and they escaped together, riding gallantly through the night. However, as time passed, they were met with Malenke warriors, the enemy kingdom of the Dugumban people. Heavily outnumbered, they knew they would surely die if they both stood and fought. They both fought bravely, and eventually the king's horsemen created enough of a distraction, sacrificing himself so that Princess Yenenga could flee. Princess Yenenga rode on northwards alone, way outside the land of Dagumba. One night, exhausted from crossing a turbulent river in a valley, they saw a house. Inside lived Rial, a hunter. He cared for her and gave her shelter. As Yenenga was still disguised as a man, Rial did not know who she really was. Seeing that Rial was a good man, Princess Yenenga decided to reveal to Rial her true identity. The two fell deeply in love. Yenenga and Rial had a son they named Wadrego, which means stallion. They named him so as it had been Yenenga's stallion that had taken her to Rial and to love. Her lineage went on to create a nation, the nation of Burkina Faso in West Africa. To this day, Wadrego is a common surname in Burkina Faso, and Queen Yenenga is honoured as the founding queen mother of the nation. The end. So yes, it's uh, thank you. So yes, it's a, it, it's a you know a nation founding story, founding myth. So uh, that's the story of how a nation was was born, and remarkably ahead of its time with its you know its um, female figure who transcended princess roles. Yeah. So um, so yeah, it's a great story, and uh, yeah, African myths are, are certainly not something that we see on the shelves too much. So I thought. That's what I bring to uh, storytelling Litslock today. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, thanks you for your wonderful stories. Had a great eclectic variety, yeah. I thought, today. We had poems, we had competition entries, we had ones created in, in, in mock exam. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's a shame that um, we didn't have a few of the other regulars to join us and so we could have heard more stories. So next week, as Miss Huntley already alluded to, we're going to talk about the Women's Prize. Now, obviously, we haven't read them, but perhaps we could talk about women's fiction in general, perhaps. Uh, yeah. And perhaps you could all think of um, either a book that's written by a, a woman, a female author, or one that features a, a female character prominently. Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. Right, so thank you, everyone. So keep reading, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.